Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 5th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. Also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discussed the Ledge Finance and Department of Revenue presentations last Friday before House Finance. They are important for a number of reasons. Second, we discussed Dittman Research's most recent polling results on the PFD. They will surprise many. And third, we discussed the recent anonymous piece in the Midnight Sun that critiques Donna Arguin. Before starting, we need to make one correction to the podcast. In the first segment, Michael and I keep using OMB when we're referring to ledge finance. Evidently, neither one of us had finished our second cup of coffee before we started the 620 segment. As you will hear, with the help of a listener, we realize and correct our error late in the segment. But I want to warn listeners of the podcast from the outset that when you hear us say OMB in the first segment, we mean ledge finance. Our apologies for the confusion. And now, let's join Michael. Well, Brad, let's uh, dive down into this. On Friday, House Finance got a briefing from OMB and uh, had some interesting things to uh, had some interesting things to say about the deficit and uh, and some eye opening things. So, why don't we dive down into that to begin with? Yeah. So, for those who haven't, uh, who didn't listen to the to the hearing on Friday before House Finance, or haven't gone to look at the slide decks that uh, that OMB and uh, Department of Revenue uh, used I I would urge if you're if you're interested in fiscal issues and I assume you wouldn't be listening to this segment if you weren't um, yeah it, it, I would urge you to go look at those uh, those slide decks we've also got them up on on our slide share page um, uh, which you can access through our uh, 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 website online um, and and they're just they're 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 fascinating uh, uh, pieces. Usually, I have not been a big fan of of OMB uh, in the past because I think they have uh, slanted the message. They claim to be nonpartisan, but I think they've continually slanted the message, certainly against the PFD. The new OMB director, Alexi Painter, um, uh, gave this presentation, and I was pleased. Not so much the information in the in the in the uh, in the presentation. We'll we'll come on to that in a moment. But in in the form of the presentation, there there was a there's a there was a big change in how OMB is looking at the budget in this presentation, and I think it's a it's a huge step forward. Um, historically, what OMB has done is just sort of given uh, their view uh, of of what the budget looks like. Um, and treated the treated the PFD in the way they wanted to, in in consultation, no doubt, with the chairs of House Finance and Senate Finance, um, and sort of and sort of muddled the OMB or the the PFD picture uh, in the course of those presentations, slanting it, frankly, toward the the PFD cut uh, alternative. A completely different approach uh, in this uh, presentation by uh, by. The new OMB director, he divided the uh, the presentation into two pieces. One, uh, what the budget looks like under current law, uh, which uh, is um, is something that I've advocated for uh, for a long time. Current law means you 
pay attention to the PFD statute. You, you, you assume that the PFD statute is followed. Uh, and then a separate presentation on current policy, which uh, basically built from last year's budget, uh, which, which does incorporate uh, a PFD cut. But a clear distinction between what the law provides and what, what current policy in the form of what the legislature did last year uh, has provided. That distinction, frankly, is, is the same as the uh, Congressional Budget Office does at the federal level, sort of the gold standard of how fiscal uh, policy uh, institutions look at these things, um, and, is, and is a completely different step uh, for OMB from, uh, from where we've been before, and I, and I think a very good one. Um, so uh, that, that's, a, that's a good out of this presentation, because I think if this continues during the legislative session, we're going to have a lot better discussion about what uh, about about the budget implications of the PFD. Now, that having been said, the numbers were horrible. I mean, the <laughs> the current law budget, uh, and when and when Alexei did the current law budget, he not only reflected the statutory PFD, which is in current law, but also full funding of school debt, uh, the 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 school bond reimbursements, which. Uh, uh, the statute that governs the school bond reimbursements, which the legislature didn't follow uh, last year, uh, REAA, Rural Education Assistance, and Community Assistance, both of which also got uh, treated differently than the statute in, uh, in last year's budget. And when he looked at the current law budget, uh, the numbers uh, were even uh, slightly worse than, than what we've been talking about previously on the program. We've been talking about a, a deficit that's $2.3 billion. Uh, taking into account the current law, the current statutory PFD. Uh, once you take into account the additional current law provisions for uh, school bond reimbursement, REAA, and community assistance, the debt is actually, the deficit is actually $2.4 billion um, uh, for FY22. So uh, a, a $100 million additional uh, deficit uh, when you observe uh, current law under those statutes as well. The current policy number, um, uh, and this is uh, this is applying what the legislature did uh, last year and just sort of rolling it another year forward in terms of ignoring the stat the PFD statute, ignoring the the school bond reimbursement statute, and and so forth. Uh, the current uh, policy deficit is 900, uh, 900 million. Some people have previously put that uh, Commonwealth North, for example, put that at one point three billion. Uh, but uh, Alexi's numbers show that, or CBO's or OMB's numbers show that it's a uh, 900 million. Um, there's additional detail in uh, in in this in this slide deck from OMB that I think is important for people to see. And again, it's you can either go to the to the web page for the hearing last Friday uh, on the House for by House Finance, or you can go to our uh, slide share page um, and and find those slides. But that's important. At the same at the same uh, presentation, um, Department of Revenue uh, talked about uh, FY22 uh, in terms of, of where we are on 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 the on the revenue forecast um, and uh, the FY22 revenue forecast that they made the FY21 and the FY22 revenue forecast that they made last year uh, last spring um, and last spring rather and. The, um, uh, the the takeaway from that is we're basically on track uh, for for uh, for the revenue forecast they gave. Uh, prices are up a little bit. We've talked about that on the program, uh, but their analysis is that volumes are down a little bit. Uh, oil volumes are down a little bit, um, and those two are sort of offsetting each other. So we sort of remain on track for the FY21 uh, and the FY22 uh, budget uh, revenues. The other thing Department of Revenue did, which was new and sort of the first time that, uh, uh, that I'd seen this presented, uh, was to talk about the tax, the old tax credits. Now the Supreme Court has invalidated HB 331, and those credits have come back to, uh, to the budget, essentially. Uh, the issue is, is you know, how do we deal with those? Uh, a lot. It, there's about 750 million dollars in uh, unpaid yet unpaid credits uh, due producers under the uh, under the old oil tax credit program, reimbursable tax credit program. Um, and the question has been how to deal with those. Some people, 
I think, have overblown it by saying, "Oh, that seven hundred fifty million dollars comes all the way comes all the way back on the budget. We're going to have to deal with it, you know, all of it next year. And how are we going to do that? And you know, do we take out of the ERA?" Uh, I think Department of Revenue did a very good job uh, walking through that and essentially saying, "Hey, we got a statute uh, that deals with that." Uh, we HB 331 tried to bond this all and sort of move it off books, uh, but now that it's coming back onto the books, we've got a statute that deals with that. Uh, and walk through, there's a slide that walks through what the repayment schedule uh, is uh, on the tax credits. And it's, it's not immaterial. Uh, the FY22, for example, uh, uh, obligation is about $25 million. Uh, under the under the statute, but it, it's not it's not the budget busting, budget exploding 750 million dollars, all c- coming back all at once that I, that I, that some people have uh, have talked about. There's one other piece of Department of Re- of the Department of Revenue slide deck that I think is uh, uh, important, uh, and it's uh, their analysis of uh, ballot measure one. Uh, Proposition One, and it looks at the actual numbers. You know, we've talked on the program a lot right. about how both the the yes on one side and the no on one side are blowing up big numbers, and you know, talking about this in terms of either you know budget saving on the yes on one side or budget or, or industry Armageddon on the on the no on one side. Um, Department of Revenue does a very good job of walking through what the actual incremental revenue is. Uh, at various price levels, we've made the point uh, on previous shows, uh, previous segments uh, here, that uh, that it depends a lot on on oil price, what oil price you assume, what the what the revenue impact is. It isn't all just immediately a billion dollars like yes on one and no on one claim. It, it, at, at the oil prices we're operating at, it's much less than that. Um, and Department of Revenue walks through uh, uh, those uh, those numbers in a way that I think is is very helpful. One thing they don't do that they could have done is do a very simple calculation of what that uh, uh, the incremental impact of ballot measure one would do on oil company costs. Department of Revenue publishes um, uh, uh, overall oil industry costs, North Slope costs. Uh, They do it both in the fall revenue forecast and in the spring revenue forecast as part of their look at, uh, at the tax situation. Costs are important to you know to, to even under SB 21. Costs are important. They they do those calculations, um, and and so you've got oil industry costs in their spring revenue forecast. They could have very easily taken these numbers uh, that they did for for ballot measure one and done the calculation, done an analysis of what that does to costs. They didn't do it. Uh, we've done it on our. Uh, Facebook page. We did an analysis over the weekend using their numbers of ballot measure one and using their numbers of oil industry costs, and showed that uh, that that ballot measure one Im- incremental impact is 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 relatively minor in terms of overall industry costs. Uh, it's a huge multiple of taxes, but if you got a low tax base and you have and you're moving to a higher tax base, you're going to have uh, high multiples out of that. The real the real factor is what it does to industry costs and. Uh, and now that now that revenue has done the ballot measure one uh, uh, revenue forecast, you can then take you can then do that calculation on costs, and we've done that on our webpage. But it a, a very important presentation last Friday, both by OMB uh, and by Department of Revenue. Uh, and I think the takeaway from it is we're in horrible shape. We are as in horrible shape as we thought we were, but we're going to get a, we're getting a lot more transparency. Out of OMB about what that what about right. exactly what that horrible shape is. Right, right. Uh, a couple things that I noticed. I mean, obviously, the first thing you were talking about is the fact that they show the deficit as being even higher uh, in out years than you and I have talked about that two point four billion dollars. The second thing that I was kind of pleasantly surprised about is under their budget review for the OMB talking about fund balances, and they show the true. Uh, you know, the true availability of what's in the CBR, what's in the ERA, and they even include those sweepable funds, uh, including the $1.1 billion held in the PCE. And uh, that usually has been sacrosanct. They usually have not talked about that. So that's kind of a whole new, that's kind of a whole new vision there. Yeah, Lex, Alexis, I, 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 I give him a lot of credit. His his focus appears to be on transparency. His focus appears to be, I'm going to give you the numbers. What we got out of Teal and what we got out of Pat was sort of here's here's the numbers I want to show you, <laughs> right? 
reflecting my bias or reflecting your bias, the, the chair's uh, bias about what we do with the PFD uh, and, and, and other things. And Alexi, consistent with, I mean, he's really, I think, adopted the CBO standard. Consistent with the, the CBO approach of transparency, uh, here's the numbers. Uh, uh, you, you can have your opinion about the numbers, but here's the numbers that you need to be dealing with. Alexi's really, I think, uh, 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 taken a taken a, a big step toward transparency. So, yeah, you're right. Uh, the yeah. fund balances are in those in there as well. All right, Brad. Well, give me the give me the thumbnail synopsis of the presentation before I let you go here. I mean, just give it to us in plain speak. What was the the main takeaways that you got out of this presentation on Friday? The main takeaways were that uh, we've got huge budget problems, uh, but but OMB is going to treat them fairly, and we're going to have transparency about uh, about about the numbers that we're going to be seeing. On the revenue side, yes, uh, uh, the all tax credits are coming back to the budget. Uh, the effort to push them off budget uh, failed. They are coming back to the budget, but they're not they're not huge uh, end of world. Uh, it's not a huge end of the world problem. Uh, when you apply the statute that's there about how we pay for those, uh, uh, they are they are somewhat of an increase in each year's budget uh, uh, for the next 10 years or so, but not a huge increase in the budget. Donna asks, Brad, Division of Finance or OMB? Oh, I see what Donna's saying. Yeah, it's Ledge Finance. I, I'm sorry. I, I kept using OMB. Yeah, I, you're right. It's Ledge Finance. Right. Harold does make a valid point. He says, too bad they're transparent after the horse already ran out of the barn. All we're getting is a picture of an empty barn at this point. <laughs> it would, sure would have been nice to get these transparent pictures earlier. Well, sure it would have been. I mean, I yeah, we, we talked about it a lot on the show. It would have been helpful to, to have Ledge Finance uh, be uh, – uh, to be more open before, uh, but um, uh, at least we got it now. Looking at these numbers and seeing, again, $2.4 billion, um, it, is, uh, it, it, it is a huge number, and I just don't know how we swallow it all. I mean, obviously, we're not going to swallow it all in one bite. You have to cut more than 50% of the budget out, but uh, it's just going to be an incredibly heavy lift for everybody out there. Yeah, and we've we've come to the end of the road. I mean, we've talked on, as, as we've talked on on previous uh, previous segments. We have no we have no savings sitting underneath us anymore. The CBR and the SBR are essentially drained. I had to chuckle uh, during the the running debates. They had Bart Lebon uh, on uh, on on the running debates. Representative Bart Lebon from Fairbanks, and he was talking about uh, the CBR the CBR. And he said, "Well, we've got to." We've got to keep a billion and a half in the CBR. I mean, that's just that's just what we need for working capital. And I'm sitting there going, we passed that a couple of years ago, Bart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the party, pal. I mean, we're 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 way down now. So it's I mean, we're we're confronting the, the number is huge, uh, and we're confronting it without any safety net underneath us. And it's just a it, it's a horrible situation. But at least we know what the situation is. I mean. Previously, previous ledge finance directors, I'll get it in my brain right this time, previous ledge finance directors have just, uh, have just uh, uh, put their finger on the scale and, and, uh, and, and you know, told the legislature essentially the predetermined outcome of policy that, that the committee chairs wanted. At least we're getting straight numbers this time. Right, right. Now, they did mention $586 million in the uh, CBR. Uh, and they mentioned the 11.7 billion in the uh, in the ERA. That's projected balance uh, on uh, July of next year. Uh, so they are actually looking at that as a potential source for revenue. And then again, the sweepable funds. So this is the first time you're actually seeing kind of all these things. And, and again, no presuppositions on the 5.5 uh, percent POMV draw or anything else. They're just saying here's the buckets that are available to you. You can you know draw or choose as you may. Well, they they are using the POMV number for for the revenue side. I mean, these these are these are fund. The, the, what, what you're seeing there are fund balances, um, um, sort of pots of money, if you will. But they are using the POMV draw uh, as the as the revenue as the revenue number for uh, for constructing the budget. So it's, it, they haven't abandoned POMV. I mean, it's there the, again. It's it's what the it's it's the current law budget and the current law includes SB twenty six and includes the includes the POMB draw. Brad, we uh, dive down into number two, which is this uh, new polling information 
from Matt Larkin over at Dittman Research. Some uh, some interesting stuff, to say the least. There's definitely some interesting uh, details in here uh, that you yeah. want to get into. As, as part of the fall uh, chamber conference uh, last week, uh, they typically have uh, Matt Larkin do uh, uh, a poll for the chamber, and then they then they present the present the results uh, uh, at the fall conference. Typically, the fall well, the fall conference up until this year has been in person. You have to register, uh, uh, go to wherever the fall conference is uh, to to hear this, and you sort of get secondhand afterwards. This year, they did it online. Uh, and so uh, Matt's explanation was uh, is online, and the slides are are online. Uh, there's it's the 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 presentations are still up uh, at the chamber website. You have to click a few times uh, to follow through the the fall uh, conference uh, and find the replays. And you and you may have to register with the chamber to do it, but there's no cost. Um, and uh, and 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 see the slide deck, but. The, the one slide deck that just fascinated me was was his slide deck on the budget solution. And basically, uh, it was the question was, do you believe that a solution to the state budget situation should be comprised mainly of, and the choices were revenue generating measures such as new taxes, cuts to state spending and services, and use or, and or uh, well, or use of permanent fund earnings, which Matt says, uh, when when asked to explain that, that they mean PFD cuts there, um, and when they give the results, they 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 title that uh, column PFD. Here's the thing that was fascinating about it: um, a lot more movement toward new revenues uh, than in previous uh, previous presentations in 2018 when they ran this question. It was 45. The response was 45 percent uh, to do it mainly through spending cuts. 35% uh, to do it through uh, new revenues, 9% to do it through uh, through uh, PFD uh, cuts. Uh, this year, when they ran it, uh, the 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 na now the the highest number uh, is for new revenues. It's 40%, only 40%, but it's still 40%. 38% say it mainly should be done through spending cuts, and PFD cuts uh, stay at 9%. Here's the thing that fascinated me. Um, in every category, and and they and and Matt breaks this down by location, um, uh, Anchorage, South Central, Interior, Southeast, rural, gender, uh, age, uh, party, uh, 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 those who have a favorable opinion of the chamber or an unfavorable opinion, those who think the state's headed in the right direction or the wrong direction, those who think more taxes are needed or less taxes are needed. Uh, and those who, who think the emphasis of government should be on protecting the environment. Every category, subcategory that he breaks these results into, uh, one there is one constant through all of them, and that is that the PFD always finishes, PFD cuts always finish last. So there are, there are categories where people think we ought to be doing cuts, um, that, that the solution ought to be composed mainly of cuts. There are categories where uh, people believe that it ought to be composed uh, of, of increased taxes. Um, but in every one of those categories, the PFD finishes last. It is the least favored option in every breakout option. In fact, even in those categories where uh, people, for the, where, the, where the strongest vote is for spending cuts first, um, the, the second choice is for new revenues uh, over PFD cuts. In other words, if somebody, if there's a category that says uh, we, that that you know, um, uh, it, the age bracket 55 to 64 says we believe strongly, essentially, that we ought to be doing cuts first. Right. But even there, new revenues is is the second choice over PFD cuts. And Matt has one line in the in, in the in the in his presentation, not on this slide, but one line in the presentation that I think is, is telling. He says, you know, what, it, what, it, what this essentially says is that the legislature has, has been acting in a way that Alaskans don't support. Right. And he says, and then he says, and so it shouldn't come as a surprise that we had all these upsets, so-called upsets in the primary, because these are legislators who have been trying, who, who, people who have been trying to lead the legislature toward a solution that Alaskans don't support. 
Right. And and you shouldn't be surprised and, when you see the and this results. this and this, this whole time. Yeah, this whole time they've been making the argument that you don't want to trade taxes for your PFD. You don't want to do this. You don't want to do that. But this poll shows that again, continuously more Alaskans would like to see taxes than a PFD or or cuts or a combination of both. Uh, PFD cuts always end up at the bottom of the barrel, no matter what. It's the lowest number of any uh, for the last uh, three years. Yep. The highest number for PFD cuts is southeast. If you break it down regionally, 19% of the people in southeast say that you ought to do, you ought to mainly balance the budget out of PFD cuts. But even there, 22% uh, favor cuts first. And 38% favor other taxes before PFD cuts. So even in the one area of the state that feels strongest uh, about PFD cuts, even there it finishes third uh, to, the, uh, to the other two options. So I think that's just a – I think that's a very telling statistic uh, about the PFD, uh, one that you don't see you know, showing up on the editorial page of the, of the ADN or the Fairbanks News Miner. Uh, one that you don't see showing up uh, uh, among among legislators, a lot of legislators, but one when when Matt polls uh, uh, polls Alaskans shows up consistently across the board. Uh, do PFD cuts uh, right. last? Uh, you can see this slide, by the way, by going to the Facebook page, and I've posted it in the chat room a couple times. And of course, you can go to Alaskans for Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets on Facebook, and you can see the slide there as well. Uh, Brad, we're running out of time here. We got about two or three minutes. Uh, I do want to touch base on number three, which is this piece in the uh, Midnight Sun blog, which is interesting because it's an anonymous piece. This lengthy, uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, well peppered anonymous piece that is a discussion of Donna Arduin's appearance on this program here a couple weeks ago, uh, and uh, it tries to take her to task, but it leaves some glaring holes. Can you give us a quick two minute thumbnail? Yeah, it's. Uh First of all, the piece is, is by anonymous, so you don't know you don't know who you're dealing with or their perspective or their or their depth of knowledge. But but one that really came through, one problem that really came through to me uh, was was the segment where uh, where he's he, he or she whoever it is is taking Donna to task for the statement she made of I made the economic case for being the PFD, and then you have the multi multi paragraph response that says Oh no, she didn't. That there's no economic PFD uh, and all these analyses that ICER has done uh, don't support uh, maintaining the PFD. Well, the problem is they don't reference, they don't take on the two primary uh, economic studies that have focused on the PFD uh, and the economic case for for the PFD, the 2016 ICER report uh, and the 2017 ITEP report. They don't mention either of those. Uh, and don't uh, don't focus and don't you know have any arguments for rebutting either of those. They take on some minor uh, peripheral ICER studies and say that those and try to blow them out of proportion. But basically, I mean, they're picking and choosing. This piece is a is a is a uh, a hit piece basically that picks and chooses what uh, what uh, what arguments they want to make and what and, and what uh, what uh, uh, analyses they want to they want to take on. And they, and at least in the case of the, of the PFD, they just dodged the two central analyses uh, that make the case that, that the PFD does have a huge economic impact. So, I mean, it, it's, it's it's fun to it's sort of in the in the in the in the uh, 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 political sense to read what whatever this person said, uh, but substantively, it's, uh, it, it, it lacks a lot in terms of uh, in t- taking on Donna's argument. To me, the most glaring thing he quotes in this uh, in this article, or he or she, whoever it is, uh, quotes in this article the 1980 ICER report by Scott Goldsmith, but fails to uh, bring into any of the any of the subsequent uh, analysis, which talks about cutting into the PFD and some other things as well. Um, you know, again, picking and choosing, cherry picking the facts that they want or the reports that that kind of bolster their argument while not having to argue against the ones that may fly contrary to what they're saying. Yeah. And he's and, and, and he or she again uh, does does pick up some 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 of these peripheral studies that machines done about uh, the impact on non durables and services uh, on uh, on uh, uh, and and the crim- and criminal and obesity and some of the stuff that some of the side analyses that uh, 
that uh, ICER's done lately about the impact of the PFD on various subtopics. But, you know, the, the, the fact that he doesn't, the fact that they don't take on the, the 2016 uh, uh, report or the 27 I, ITEP report, I think is just, is just huge. I mean, those are the two seminal studies out there on the impact of, uh, uh, of the PFD on the Alaska economy and Alaska families. And to ignore those, just, <laughs> I mean, it, ignoring those just makes clear that, that whoever this person is, is just going to pick their way uh, uh, through to find, to find points that they can complain about uh, without trying to really substantively ad- advance the debate by, by taking on the, the major, the major studies. Uh, yeah. It, uh, as I, as I looked through this and again, this is a, you know, they, they go through a lot of different things and make a lot of different claims here. Uh, but the long and the short of it is it is an attempt, I think, in the long run to discredit uh, pretty much anything Donna has done with any of the other states uh, out there and shown her track record on it. Uh, I think my favorite my favorite comment was that she uh, she basically, uh, uh, you know, comes on pugnacious and I mean, all these kind of. Uh, invective saying she basically knows better than everybody else, which I find ironic, especially when you're dealing with uh, legislators. Yeah, it's it's not it's you know it's it's the it's a political hit piece. It's not a substantive rebuttal. Uh, it's the stuff that you would find in the landmine or you know on the other side must read or in uh, or or Midnight Sun, which is where it's published. It's it's a it's a politically driven. Uh, cherry picked uh, attack on on certain areas as opposed to an actual substantive let's deal with the hard issues uh, uh, analysis and and you know I think a lot of people try to make it into that substantive analysis but it's just not it's a it's a political hit piece well and I guess the most telling part about the whole thing is that it is anonymous and in fact this is the commentary from Matt Buxton. <laughs> Uh, by an anonymous in the know person. Note from the editor: No one loves anonymous authors, but we're a blog. Like that's an excuse. This post originally came in as a tip from a trusted source and was close enough to a post that we worked to hammer it into shape. Um, and and again, like I said, any time that somebody uh, posts anonymously, and it, it just again to me that just there's a stink to it that. You know, if you're going to stand behind it, stand behind it. I've said things before. I've been proven wrong before and taken that when I've been proven wrong. But I've always stood behind what I've said uh, until proven otherwise. And uh, this just to me, any time that somebody comes in with the, you know, the uh, the mask of uh, a V for Vendetta on their face, I just go, nope, that that doesn't bode well. Yeah, I've seen some anonymous stuff that's, that's good substantively. And, and I would, if it was a substantive piece and took on this stuff substantively, I'd I might give it some weight, even though it's anonymous. But but this isn't. I mean, it's just it it, it as I said, it's a cherry pick political hit piece, and it's just. I mean, and so being anonymous sort of adds adds on to the the lack of weight uh, behind it. It's just there's just when when you look for it. I mean, I I had somebody write me and say, "Oh, you got to read this. This is this this is this is the the rebuttal." And so I read it and I went, "No, nah, there's no there there." I mean, it's just. You're 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 picking your way around uh, the the substantive the, the substantive uh, conversation uh, just to you know just to score political points. So. Right, exactly. Uh, interestingly enough, there's a comment in the chat room today from former Representative Paul Seaton who asks, "So oil tax credit payments are small, but will take all the budget savings from the entire cut to the university?" To which I said, I would argue it's small compared to the potential of $800 billion that is owed overall, or even the previous $75 million plus statutory minimum payments. What say you? Well, they are, I, I mean, the oil tax credit repayments under the statute are small. Um, and, and they've got to be accounted for in the budget, but they're not going to swamp the budget. So I, um, I'm uh, I mean, they're they're part of the mix. Uh, uni- the university's got to be cut for other reasons. The university's got to be cut because we got a two point four billion dollar uh, uh, deficit. Um, but uh, oil oil tax credits alone aren't the reason to uh, to cut the university budget. That's that's existing because of the overall deficit. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board today. As always, a good a good discussion. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate you being on board uh, the program today. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. 
Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.